All right, shall we? I might have to get on the scale today. Yeah. I got on a scale the other week for the first time in two years. And? <laughs> still, you didn't like it. I did not well, like it. Had, yeah. What was your highest playing weight? Highest? Highest. 310. I played most of my career at like 295. You look proportionate. I was 275 by the time I was 14. Really? I was 6'4", 275 when I was 14. Jeez. Yeah. You got all these skinny guys working with you. There we go. 115 over 70. Is that good? Phenomenal. It's like an 18-year-old woman. Wow. So I'm not implying anything. There we go. <laughs> okay. How often do you have conversations surrounding CTE? I'm a physician, so I treat athletes. I meet with them face-to-face -face all day long and deal with every neurological problem or brain health problem that they have. Most commonly, we hear younger athletes and parents especially of younger athletes asking about how many concussions is too many concussions, and then they get concerned about you know, downstream effects. All the labels that we use are distractions. Uh, calling something PTSD, calling something TBI, calling it, you know, concussion or mild TBI, they're all distractions because they're trying to fit everybody into uh, a definition as opposed to looking at the science, looking at really what's going on. They're trying to fit the people into a square box instead of looking at what is there. Yeah. You talked about how it was important to read the fine print of CTE and concussion literature. Why, why is that important? A lot of the literature that explains a finding only explains one finding. And maybe it's the most fascinating finding or the newest finding or the finding that's going to land on USA Today. At the bottom of all these papers will be a disclosure that says, listen, this came from an isolated sample of 100 professional athletes that thought that they all had a problem anyway. This doesn't represent the entire population. Uh, it doesn't even represent entire non-athlete population or entire football population. Everybody's looking for a holy grail, looking for, you know, something that is hidden. There's nothing hidden. All the information is there. All you have to do is pick up the articles and read them. If someone walks into my clinic and says, I think I have CTE, or usually it's their wife dragging him and says, I think he has CTE, I'm not going to know for sure until he dies and we have a pathology specimen. So the first thing that we have to evaluate is, is this organic depression? Is it coming from a sudden retirement or just an unprepared retirement? Or was it already there to begin with, but essentially the exercise in the sport was treating the depression? You know, when people are faced with neurocognitive decline or changes in their health, it's, you know, it still comes down to people and the decision they make with that information. And, and some people will go, go out and try to find answers. And some people will just kind of allow other people to uh, dictate what's wrong with them. That's right. I see a lot of former players that are, you know, that 48 to 52 age range that are coming in concerned when I'm, when really they just need to lose weight and get their sleep apnea treated and exercise. I think the biggest thing that I was, I was so confused about is when I saw players going on national television doing an interview, right, saying, you know, I have CTE, right, you know, but they haven't done any research or read any literature to kind of better understand or even to articulate what their issues are. I think all football players have it. You know you have it right now? I know we, I know we all have it. We all have it. We all have it. Are we you assuming play. that or have you been tested or I don't know if there's I've, really any sort of test for it, but right. technically. Right. Do you feel something? No, I mean, it's a, I mean, yeah, but it's a, uh, and it affects, it, it does affect daily life, you know, and there's, it's, it's more of something that, that some of those that are around me mm -hmm. say, yeah, I can see where this issue or you're stuttering a little bit or your memory, you know, uh, hmm. lapses here and there. And, and I think it's something, and there's also some symptoms that I don't even, I don't even know how to explain. It's hard for me to re-explain to other people the turmoil my stomach was in driving to the stadium. The anxiety you have, the pressure, it's enormous. 
You can't become a pro unless you're obsessed. That's what makes us weird people sometimes to be around because we spent most of our 20s at work on camera. If you went to work and your boss taped you from the moment you walk in the door to the moment you leave, to where if you slid your chair back, somebody would be like, hey, stop right there. You, that wasn't the most efficient way to get up. We lost a half a second of productivity today because you did a 30 degree turn and not a 15 and a half degree turn. Mm. That's standard? That's crazy. Like people say, what do you love about the game? I love that I learned to handle chaos. When they blow that whistle, when that ball is snapped, order turns to chaos. How are you gonna handle it? You're gonna use those same skills, but now you have control. Now you get to pick the scheme. Now we're running Jared's defense. I got the headset now. You know what, and I've wanted the headset for a long time, and I'm gonna prove it to you what I'm gonna do when I get the headset. This is my life. I'm not gonna wait on the NFL to do anything. What if they just choose to never do anything? So you're just gonna sit back and be like, well, they, they hired me, they employed me, I'm going through this and they need to fix it. No, fix yourself. It's training. You eat the right food, yeah. you, you live the right lifestyle to support muscle growth. Same thing in your brain, keep doing that. Hello, doctor. Yeah, hey. This is Jared. Hey, Jared, come on in. Oh, thanks. Hey, guys. Hey there. Hey. How you doing? Good, good. One of the analogies that we make often is that what's going on in these various groups is very much like if you took your car in to a mechanic and you said, hey, my car's not working that well. And they look at it and they say, oh, Jared, yeah, this is called car not working syndrome. And you say, well, wait a minute, aren't you gonna check these various things? Well, no, we don't check those because they're not reimbursed. So people aren't actually checking the things that cause the problem. It doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. but that's the way they've been trained. So with CTE, you know, everyone's trying to push to be, it's just like Game of Thrones, everyone's trying to push to be a leader. I wanna publish more, I wanna do more. Don't tell me to change my direction because I'm winning the f battle right now. But the problem is they don't have any good results. Mm. When, when you have suicidality, depression, rage, mood swings, all of those things, we see that happening to people outside of getting hit in the head over and over right. again. Sure. So how do we differentiate these things? Is there a way to differentiate that? Yeah, so that's a really good point. The common triad of symptoms is aggression, depression, and dementia. So you're absolutely right. You can have depression for other reasons. You can have aggression for other reasons. You can have dementia for other reasons. I mean, this again gets back to, I'm doing my job. My job is to get grants and do research and develop drugs. But my job is not to say, what's the best outcome I can get for these people? And that's unfortunate. studying the brain, it's a frontier. It's a frontier, very much like space, very much like the deepest parts of the ocean, is that there's a handful of people that can really describe what we're looking at. Oh, I think I left my coffee in here or something. Fuck. Oh yeah, you did. Yeah. It's CT. <laughs> oh, all the movie magic, just gone. Yeah. Head up. Yep. Cool. Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It.
the narrative that's coming out, it's stated again and again and again, and it's propagated in places like the New York Times. CTE is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. I mean, that's a very, very strong term. I see progressive neurodegenerative diseases. I see when people come to autopsies and, they, you know, people so, with Al Alzheimer's, ALS, they're emaciated, they're in a vegetative state for a couple of years. And so to use that terminology for CTE um, is a very, very strong state. If that were true, the only responsible thing to do at that point is to stop the sport. You can't tweak a rule here and there or strap on a helmet a certain way. There's a big disconnect between that and the reality. What is the reality? That um, CTE, as it's, as it's presented to the public, is quite a lot different than what it actually is. What, what CTE actually is is an interesting finding that has no particular significance in terms of clinical impact. It's interesting to find that you're saying that there's so much subjectivity to sure. something that the general population would consider yeah. scientific. I think the population thinks, thinks it's, it's some measurable quantity. You, know, you, you stick it in the machine and it spits out an answer, thumbs up or thumbs down. That's not the case. One example is linking CT to suicidality. Domestic or violence behavior and suicidality. suicidality. That is just off the charts irresponsible. I mean, and nobody talked about suicidality in, 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 in 100 years of boxing and all of the brutality that they experienced. It never came up. What statements do you hear publicly that you would, if you were in a, in a, in a room, you would smack your hand on the table and say, I object? That is progressive. There's no evidence for it. Calling it a neurodegenerative disease. Neurodegenerative disease means that you're losing brain substance. It's falling apart. It's, it's becoming destroyed. It's leaving. Tau accumulates with everybody with age, so you can find tau and you can take pictures of it and you can illustrate it. And um, I never viewed it as particularly meaningful. And CTE is in very, very early stages and very poorly understood. And frankly, it's hyped. What would make somebody want to prop up this hype? There are a lot of uh, non-scientific issues surrounding it. There's, there's advocacy, you know, somebody wants to start an advocacy or, you know, a nonprofit, and then they get involved with families. Eight months ago, I lost my best friend, my college sweetheart, and my husband of 18 years. You see these families that are suffering, and I feel that I need to speak for them. Advocacy for a football player is necessary, and it's a good thing, but advocacy as a concept is 180 degrees out of phase with the scientific mode of inquiry. So you're telling me that scientists aren't supposed to be advocates? That's correct. If you're advocating, you're kind of excusing yourself from a scientific discussion at that point. Sometimes when I hear some neuropathologists out there talking about safety, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't study safety, I study brains. And if you want to study safety, study crash dummies or something. They're immediately going from very flimsy data and becoming advocates for a cause. We need to take radical steps to change the way football is played. There is no justifiable reason whatsoever that any child under the age of 18 should continue to play these games. The whole process of science, it's not a source of authority. It's not telling you what to think. It's a mode of inquiry, you know, a sort of challenging theory with observations and dispassionately. You know, you're not supposed to call somebody a denier if they disagree with what you say.